Good morning. So good to see you. So good to have you with us. It's a big crowd in the Family Center, and uh, you know it's good that uh, we have enough room for everybody this morning. Uh, maybe you're visiting. I think it was Sing Song Weekend, so we appreciate you being with us this morning for whatever reason that you are here, and hope that you'll come back and be with us anytime you can. I read a story the other day about Chuck Norris. It was on the internet, so it has to be true. But he was sitting in a diner by himself, eating his food, minding his own business, and over walks this rather large gentleman who tells him, you're in my seat, you need to move. So what do you think Chuck Norris did? Yeah, roundhouse kicked him in the face, right? No, he didn't. He simply got up without saying a word and moved over to another table and began eating again. Well, some time passed and the man recognized who he was. It, it, it came to his mind, oh, that's Chuck Norris. So he goes over there and he apologizes. And Chuck Norris says, that's no problem. And they struck up a conversation for several minutes and apparently they're friends still today. Now people look at that situation and they say, well, you know, Chuck Norris was a little too passive in that situation. He was a bit of a doormat letting somebody walk all over him like that. Somebody else might say, you know, he should have gone all Walker, Texas Ranger on him and taken matters into his own hands because, you know, the only way that you're going to cure that is you got to teach people how to treat you, right? Still others would say that Chuck Norris exercised great strength under control. And, you know, our world would use any one of those definitions as a description of meekness. Here's how we often think of meekness. That's how we think of meekness, isn't it? Handle with care. Be easy. Don't be so rough. Be gentle. This is how we define meekness in our culture. Meekness is seen as weak and passive and, 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 and cowardice and, and being spineless or milquetoast. That's how we often define meekness in our culture. And really, you know, you think about it. If you're applying for a position as CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you sit down with the board of directors and they ask you, you know, what's your greatest strength? You say, well, I'm meek. How many football coaches you know that are meek? How many linebackers you know that are meek? We don't often associate meekness with something positive. We live in a power-happy world. We live in a world that's obsessed with competition. We live in a world that lives by its own beatitude, right? Blessed are the aggressive, for they shall inherit the earth. It's a dog-eat-dog world. It's survival of the fittest. It's every man for himself. The order of society is to use strength and power to get what you want. Meekness is not a virtue in our culture. But maybe it would be if we understood it better. There's an old fable attributed to Aesop about the wind and the sun, and they have this competition. They look down and they see a man walking down a lonely road, and the wind says to the sun, I bet you I can remove the coat from that man. And the sun says, okay, go for it. And so the wind blows and blows and blows really, really hard so that the leaves are, are, are leaving the trees and, and the squirrels and the birds are clutching on for dear life to the limbs. But the man just simply pulls his coat tighter to stay warm. So the sun gives it a shot. The sun starts shining brighter and brighter. The man begins to feel warmth, so he unbuttons his coat and as the sun shines brighter and brighter, the man eventually takes off his coat. And the wind says, how did you do that? And the sun says, it was easy. He says, I lit the day. Through gentleness, I got my way. And that's how we are as Christians, or at least we should be, right? The world is like the wind. The world just blows and blows and blows until it gets its way. But we as Christians bring something different to the table, right? We are the sun, maybe we could say we are, you know, followers of the sun, S-O-N, right? And we, we follow after Jesus and we light the world with, with meekness and the radiance of our Lord. Because our greatest example of meekness is Jesus Christ. Our Lord entered a power-happy world and he turned it upside down. The people wanted a Messiah who would reign on an earthly throne and rule with brute force, who would dispose of all their enemies and bring them comfort and, and, and convenience what they got was a savior, though, who said, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. They wanted a Messiah that would ride in on a war horse, instead he rode in on a donkey, right? 
He was born as a helpless baby in a manger in a barn to peasant parents. He was far from the description of the Messiah that they had formed in their minds. He didn't come to earth in a blaze of glory. He verbally butchered the religious elite for not showing empathy and, and, and mercy on those who were considered the dregs of humanity. And he taught us a new way to interact in the world. But nowhere do we see the meekness of Jesus more vividly than in the last hours of his life. When he was arrested, when he was put on trial, when he stood before the high priest, when he stood before Pilate, when he was flogged, when a crown of thorn was placed on his head and a purple robe draped over his bloody body, when he carried his own cross and when he was hung on it. Why do these events showcase the meekness of Jesus? Here's why. Because he didn't stop it. He could have at any time. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. He never took matters into his own hands. He could have turned those arresting soldiers into dust. He could have struck Pilate dead where he stood. At any moment, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Why did Jesus say in the garden, yet not my will be done, but yours, God? Why did he say that? Well, yes, because he was submissive and obedient, but also because Jesus saw the bigger picture. There was a bigger picture in mind. He was about the Father's business. That's why he didn't take matters into his own hands. Our Lord showed tremendous restraint in the last hours of his life. He displayed incredible meekness by allowing God's will to win. 1 Peter chapter 2. I, I know that y'all read that in the opening this morning. So we'll put it on the screen. I won't, I won't read it for you again, but you can refer to that. But why didn't Jesus revile in return? Why didn't he utter any threats? Why did he just take it and not say anything? Because he had entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. God had a plan, and that plan had to play out. Jesus entrusted himself. He submitted himself to that plan. And you know what that is? Meekness, right? Meekness. Let me ask you. When you read through the Gospels, especially when you look at the, the passion of Jesus Christ, the last few hours of his life, do you get the impression that Jesus was weak? Because that's what we often say. Our culture often dubs meekness as weakness. But do you see anything about Jesus being weak in the last moments of his life? I mean, he was tougher than John Wayne at the end of his life, wasn't he? I mean, you think about all that he endured, all that he put up with. That, I mean, just resisting the temptation to turn everybody into a french fry. I mean, he could have done that, and he didn't. He showed tremendous restraint. He showed tremendous power as he endured those last few hours of his life. A Roman soldier ripping his body to shreds, and at any moment he could have taken that whip away from him and given him a taste of his own medicine, and he doesn't. He shows tremendous restraint. Now let me ask you, is that weak? Not hardly. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, actually Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And what we read starting out in Matthew 5 is we read about these Beatitudes. Now understand, these Beatitudes have a logical progression. Okay, they're, they're not random. Each one of them builds on the other. And the very first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means, very similar to what we talked about last week, it means humility, right? It means being humble. It means submitting to God's will in all circumstances. You're allowing him to be in control. There will be no one in heaven who is not first poor in spirit. So poor in spirit comes first. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, and Jesus is talking to potential followers here, right? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to be first poor in spirit. And once you are poor in spirit, once you have submitted to the will of God and allowed him to be in control, you understand that your life is nothing and it has no meaning and no purpose without God. And so therefore, you mourn your spiritual condition. You mourn the fact that you have nothing, no hope without God. And so spiritual mourning should lead to godly sorrow, which should cause one to repent. Change of mind, a change of will, a change of heart, a change of direction in life. There has to be conviction before there's conversion. So you have poor in spirit, which leads to spiritual mourning, which then leads to what? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
To be meek means that I understand that I am not in control, that it's not about me, that there's a bigger picture in mind here. I have mourned my spiritual condition. I have repented. I've allowed God to be in control of my life. And now I am meek and I understand that the path to heaven is three big steps down, right? Poor in spirit, mourning, meek. Poor in spirit, hopeless without God. Mourning, godly sorrow, meek, God controlled. Do you see the progression? Many years ago, I spoke to some prisoners at the Independence County Jail in Batesville, Arkansas. I was surprised that they were actually listening. I mean, I didn't expect that. Their eyes were glued on me as I, I, I gave a very simple message. And the thing I said was, you guys have lived your life on your own terms. You have done things your way. And how's that worked out for you? Not very well. Because you've ended up here in prison. So why not try it God's way? Why not just see what happens when you allow God to be in control and you follow in the footsteps of Jesus? How about that, right? And not everyone winds up in prison who takes control of their own life. Some people are living in a prison of sin and self-deprecation. Some people are victims of a power-happy world and they believe with all their heart that the only way to survive is to assert your will and to dominate and to, you know, to crack the eggs in order to make an omelet so you can climb the ladder of success like we talked about last week. Here's the deal. What we desperately need to understand is that meekness wins the day. It does. Meekness wins the day. Meekness is a path to victory. It was for Jesus and it is for all of us. It may not win you a political campaign. It may not get you a spot in the finals on American Idol. It may not, uh, it, it may not make you a champion UFC fighter. But there are certainly things more important than that, right? Being a child of God and walking in the footsteps of Jesus requires one to be meek because that is a path to victory. Turn with me to Psalm 37. And you say, why Psalm 37? Because that's where Jesus is pulling from when he says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And so in, under, in order to understand Jesus' words better, we need to understand where he's pulling them from. And he often referred back to the scriptures, which would have been the Old Testament, right? And so he pulls from Psalm 37. We'll dig deeper into Psalm 37 tonight, but I want to give you a bit of an overview this morning. And one of the things that you need to understand is with the Psalms, many of them are hymns. They're not just Psalms, they're hymns, okay? This, in many ways, is Israel's hymn book. This is their song book. And so many of these psalms were actually sung. Why were they sung? Well, it wasn't just to showcase their voice. No, these psalms were sung to encourage, to edify, to praise God. All the same reasons why we sing today. Although we have often lost the purpose for why we sing, we turn to Ephesians 5.19 and we use that as our definitive stance on a cappella singing which is fine and good, but that's not what Paul's doing in Ephesians 5.19. Yes, we sing, and yes, we sing a cappella, but Ephesians 5.18-21 through 21 is one long sentence in the Greek. So just to pluck out verse 19 and make it stand by itself misses a lot of things. And what you have to understand is that for Paul, when he says sing, making melody in your heart, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, what he's talking about is a theological experience. Our singing is to encourage, to edify, to uplift, but also to educate. At least it was in the first century, and it still should be today. We sing to praise God, but we also sing to educate. Why did you sing the ABCs when you were a kid? To learn them, right? How about in Bible class? Why did you sing the names of the apostles? Why did you sing the books of the Bible? To learn them, right? Because anytime you're learning a large chunk of information, you set it to a tune and it's easier to remember. Something else that needs to be understood about this psalm and Israel's hymns in general, this psalm here is an acrostic. We use acrostics today. An acrostic simply means that each line begins with a different Hebrew letter. Actually, every other verse or every fourth line in the Hebrew text begins with a different letter. We use acrostics today. Here's one. What's that an acrostic for? I gave it away with the picture, right? That's an acrostic for how to remember the colors of the rainbow. 
And we do this all the time. We, we use acrostics to remember the planets or maybe something else that we're learning in school. Again, help us to remember a large chunk of information to memorize it. So when we look at Israel and why they sang, we're looking at spe specifically why they're singing this song, this hymn in Psalm 37. We understand that songs reflect the time. They often reflect what the composer, author was going through as well. All of you can remember a song that when it comes on the radio, it takes you back to a time in your life. There are certain songs that when you hear them, they, they take you back to certain points in your life and they have certain memories associated with them. Same here, exact same thing here. It's hard not to be uplifted when you sing Blue Skies and Rainbows or Our God, He is Alive. And so Israel is singing to remember, to educate, to edify, to uplift but also to encourage and to remember. So what is going on in Israel's world as they sing this song? Notice, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Evil will not win. That is the message of this song. It's why they're singing it, to remind them that evil will not win. When life doesn't seem fair, when the bad guys seem to be winning, when it seems like there's opposition at every turn, hang on because God is in control and God's going to bring about victory. Notice the language. Do not fret. Trust in the Lord and do good. Commit your way to the Lord. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Why? Why not worry? Why, why, why forsake anger and not be wrathful? Why? Because God's in control. He's got this. Let him be in control. And when you let God be in control, when you let him handle this, this wrath stuff and this vengeance stuff and don't take matters into your own hands, you know what you call that? Meekness. When you let God operate, that is called meekness. The Israelites are singing to remind themselves that God's got this. He's in control. It's a hymn of encouragement. There were times when it seemed like evil is winning. And there were times when, when they were tempted to believe that maybe God had forsaken them. Just as there are times in our lives where we are tempted to believe that evil is winning. When we look around us and we see sickness and death and tsunamis and earthquakes and, and, and school shootings. And we think yeah yeah evil death claimed another victim they're winning but they're not they're not vengeance and wrath are God's domain and he's going to take care of all this someday in the future he's going to take care of all this just delight yourself in the Lord and do good don't take matters into your own hands you know why because every time we react in anger you know what we do we sin because very few of us, if any of us, are capable of giving in to our anger and not allowing it to consume us and act unrighteously. It just, that's what happens. This is God's business, not yours. God majors in the stuff like vengeance and wrath. That's why he tells you not to. Now this is tough because he doesn't do it immediately, right? We want him to act immediately. We want him to be tough immediately and be hard on those who oppose us. That's not how this works. Verse 4 is one, of, is one of those prosperity passages that folks turn to and erroneous apply, erroneously apply to their, their physical well-being and the health and wealth stuff. But this is not about instant results. This is a song that is being sung for encouragement, for anticipation, for hope. But it wasn't something that was going to happen tomorrow for these people. It's kind of like your 401k. You've got to sit it there and leave it alone, don't you? 
you start looking at it every day, you say, wow, I'm making money hand over fist, I'm rich. And then you look at it the next day, you're like, oh, I'm losing money hand over fist, I'm poor. You're in it for the long haul. This is a long-term vision. It's not day-to-day stuff. The enemy may win the day. He may claim a lot of victims along the way, but he won't win in the end. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. Our temptation is to confront evil and destroy it because we live in an action movie culture where the good guy rides in on a white horse. He tortures and maims all the bad guys. And that's what we want. We feel vindicated, right? Even in the Bible, we look at the stories about David and Goliath or Joshua or Gideon. And we say, I want to be that. I want to be David. I, and we have sermon series designed around that. Be a David and, and you know, conquer the giants in your life. But picture yourself as just an average Joe Blow Israelite because that's who you would have been. Put yourself in their sandals. Imagine being an average Joe Israelite standing off to the side, enduring the opposition, enduring the oppression, enduring the affliction. Because that's what all of us would have been. We can say we'd love to be a David and be the hero and lop off the giant's head and parade it through town, but most likely we would have been just one of the crowd. The Israelites are singing to remind themselves that God's in control, that he wins the day. It's a celebration and anticipation of God's salvation. It's also a beautiful description of meekness. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Meekness says, I will wait. Meekness says, I will wait. I will wait for the Lord because I have the long haul in view. He is in control. Therefore, I will let him work. Meekness is buying into the bigger picture when you want to give in to your frustration and your anger. Meekness is about trusting in God and patiently holding on until the bigger picture comes into into fruition, into view. Meekness assumes adversity. You realize that, right? Meekness assumes opposition. Meekness assumes that there's an enemy at work. And so the meek individual says... I'm going to resist the temptation to act out and to launch out on my own and take care of this matter because I know that God is in control. He is at work and meekness is a path to victory. The Israelites were headed to the promised land. That wasn't in doubt. Could they trust in God and let him work? Victory was assured. All they had to do was submit to God's will and let him work, right? So what's the connection with Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5? Well, you probably already discovered it. If meekness assumes adversity, if meekness assumes trouble, if meekness assumes adverse circumstances, what are these people listening to Jesus on the mount, what are they about to endure if they follow him? Yeah, affliction, difficulties, adversity. Because Jesus was honest enough to say, life isn't fair. I don't know where you got that, but life isn't fair. And it's certainly not going to be fair if you follow me. In fact, you're going to endure persecution and you're probably going to die. But there's a bigger picture in mind. There's something bigger at play here. Why would Paul say, return good for evil? Why would Jesus say, turn the other cheek and go the extra mile? Why would Peter use Jesus as our example of someone who didn't take matters into their own hands? Because God's people must be meek, and they must have the long haul in view. They must buy into God's bigger picture. And if they will do that... They will see the promised land. But we all have to admit that this is pretty humorous, isn't it? I mean, really, when you think about it, this is pretty funny because Jesus could not have been talking to a more unpromising group of people. You think about this. You're going to inherit the earth. What, us? We're the dregs of humanity. Everybody looks down their nose at us. We are the sinners. We are the destitute. We are the afflicted. Nobody wants us. We have been chewed up and spit out by a power-happy society, which, by the way, was run by religious elite people. 
And you're telling me that we're going to inherit the earth, that we are the ones who are blessed because we're facing all this stuff? And Jesus says, yeah. And the reason why is because God's got this. You will win. And when Jesus said these beatitudes, when he spoke these words, and he basically says you will win, there must have been some chuckling in the audience. There must have been some people that thought, yeah, right, you can't be serious. It was a radical concept then, and it's a radical concept now. It's not the mean and cruel that win. It's not the oppressive that win. It's not those who have the most toys that win. It's not those who have all the weapons and who are the most formidable that win. It's not those who assert their will that win. Yes, they may win now. They may actually win the day, but they don't win in eternity. You know who does win? You know who the victors are? You know who the winners are? Look around you. Look to your side, look around you. You are the winners. You are the victors. We win. But this is about letting God work. Meekness says, I will wait. Mark the blameless and behold the upright. For there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. We win. Even though it seems like we may be losing right now. Some of you are dealing with things that makes you, that makes you feel defeated. I mean, you think about the language of our culture. We look around us and, and we have loved ones that die of Alzheimer's or cancer. And we say, well, you know, so-and-so uh, gave up the battle and cancer won. No, it didn't. Cancer never wins. Cancer never wins. Not for the child of God. Not for the meek child of God. Well, Alzheimer's claimed another victim. No, it didn't. Alzheimer's doesn't win. We are the ones that inherit the land. We are the ones that live in victory for all eternity, even though right here, right now, it seems like we're losing. Even though we endure at the hands of evil, as we'll talk about tonight, there's one last enemy, and it's already been defeated as well, death. We rise victorious. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed. Even in ways that we don't even understand sometimes, we are blessed no matter what. As long as we have you, we have everything. May we remember that. May we seek to follow in your footsteps and be who you would have us to be and follow you right into the promised land, into eternity with you where we get to reign and dwell with you forever and ever. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Kevin's going to lead us in a song if we can help you in some way. If you're dealing with uh, affliction, if you're having struggles in your life and you need the prayers and support of this church family, let us help you. And maybe you're, uh, maybe you're struggling in your daily walk with God. Maybe you don't even have a daily walk with God. You're just trying to figure all this out. Let us help you with that too. Or maybe you're ready to take the next step, whatever that may be. Maybe you're ready to immerse yourself in a life of discipleship by being immersed in the waters of baptism. Let us help you. Come as we stand and as we sing.